Hi guys, welcome to our panel on what it takes to publish a board game. Uh, my name is Tom, I run the group Nerds of the West, you can catch us on YouTube and Twitch, but today most of what we are covering is talking to our friend Joel Lewis. Joel, please tell the audience who you are and what you've done. How are you going guys, my name is Joel, I am the owner of Nurse Shark Games. Uh, I designed Fluttering Souls which was signed on with Good Games Publishing and launched at Gen Con last year. Today we are going to be going through, hopefully, all of the steps that it takes to publish a board game. I am not a board game designer, but I am a huge fan of board games. Nerds of the West covers them in every way, shape and form. Um, and I'm going to talk through with Joel everything that it took for him to get Fluttering Souls from the idea stage all the way through to what it took to get it published and out there on shelves. So I'm just going to jump straight into it. Ideas, when it comes to anything, you, you can't force an idea, can you, Joel? Um, yes and no. Um, I think that's a complicated question because a lot of people say do you start with mechanics or theme. In my case, I love starting with competitions where you are literally forced into a position where you have restrictions on components, theme, ways that you can design a game. Um, I love the button child ones where they force a small amount of cards, 18 cards, and make you pick a, a, a mechanic. And the last one was worker placement. So it does force you to think outside the box and utilise those resources. So it, a lot of people say mechanical theme. In this instance, it was it was mechanic, but it actually came about because of a competition where mm. I was so restricted as to what I could actually do. It's the, the the paradox of openness. If you've got every choice, you don't know what choices to make. Exactly. Where, yeah. where if you if you limit down the scope of what you're having to come up with, you'll start to think a whole lot more abstractly. Um, and I believe Fluttering Souls started, as you said, as a button shy 18 card game. Yeah, it was um it was a Gen Can't competition. So button shy runner Gen Can't comp where basically anybody who can't make it to Gen Con, uh, you know, they. I guess they put out a, a competition where you have 18 cards you have to design again and they will launch it come Gen Con. Um, so in this one it was 18 cards and there was no, at that time I don't think there was any real limitations. Mm. Um, so I'd come up with a couple of ideas and funnily enough this one I never actually got to completion to, um, to the competition. Oh. Um, but it was the first game that I designed where my wife turned around and went, yeah I like that, I'll play it again. I was like, <laughs> All right, I'm I'm continuing with this one. <laughs> How many games had it taken to get to that I think, point? Though? I think this was the fifth. <laughs> okay. So not not your first experience of designing a game, and and that's probably the biggest advice I can give anyone in a creative endeavor is try things first, and your first couple aren't going to be good. Oh, my first two games were hot garbage. Um, one of them was, oh, what did we try to do? It was basically we we're trying to get a child to their first birthday and overcome adversities but utilising kind of like a love letter style where you only have one card and you're like, oh, they're teething, how do you combat that? And it, it was interesting but it kind of came about because the friend and I who were designing with, we both just had our first kids. So we're like, hey, we're living this, how can we... <laughs> but... <laughs> That's such a... Coming from a filmmaking background, having board game design as that like creative outlet is such an interesting idea to me. Um, did, did any of that influence then Fluttering Souls, either mechanically or... I, I guess my question is, did any of your previous designs come out in Fluttering Souls and, and grow into Absolutely what it not. is now? No, okay. no, um, the inspiration for Fluttering Souls was very much um, Mahjong and kind of the old school pyramids on your computer. Um, the publisher who's, who's actually signed it said, nobody will probably believe you when you say this, but I hadn't played Seven Wonders Duel when I'd played this, and a lot of people yeah. do link that similarity, and now having played it, I'm like, oh yeah, I can definitely see. This yeah. is the Sushi Go version of Seven Wonders Duel, like Sushi Go is... Seven Wonders. Which, which also isn't a bad way to design a game, is to, to have a look at what's out there and see if you can simplify it or add mechanics together or, or, uh, or t take inspiration from something else that's out in the world. Absolutely. Like, you look at so many games and every game that says it's a worker placement game, there has been a boatload of worker placements before. It's not to say that yours isn't going to be absolutely fantastic and you're going to love designing it or playing it, but yeah. it's probably been done the same you know, way, shape or form. So, so this... Fluttering Souls didn't get a didn't get into to button side game. Oh no, I didn't. I didn't finish it in time. So where did it go from there? You you had a game that your wife liked. How did you take it from a, a basic idea? What what form was it even in when your so wife played it, and where did it go it from there? It was literally a bunch of playing cards, and uh, that comes to the um, you know, what do you use to prototype? Anything you have lying around. This was literally 18. I mean, the final version now has got 36 cards, but the original had 18, and they were just face value cards from a deck of cards mm. and given random point values, and which were significantly different from what they are now. And it was just a simple 
collecting cards. So we just used what we had and at the time. It was a deck of cards and a couple of tokens. And just the one one layout for how you set up the, the, oh, the yeah, games yeah. at the, the time? Oh, yeah, yeah. There was only one um, to begin with, and it was, you know, your pyramid kind of style. Um, that was the one layout, and we just... Uh, up until, to be honest, up until working with a publisher, I had tried a whole bunch of different ones, but I could never balance them. Yeah. Um, it got to the point where I balanced a system of scoring that worked with that pyramid and then tried a few and couldn't balance them. I went, oh, well, I guess I'll keep it at 18 cards, but that obviously isn't how it kind of ended up. So when we were testing it, um, I had a, a very short list of of what points had seemed to you know, promising when I was designing it. And then when I went to the first play test, um, I actually didn't have listed on the cards what each of them were. I just told the person I was playing with. And the, you know, the one out here on my left is basically, that is the first version that I took out. And I'd sit down with people and say, oh yeah, the blue morpho, three of them will give you six points. And I said, oh, you really should put that in the top. But little did they know, the next person, oh, three blue morphos is going to give you four points <laughs> just to see if I can balance it. <laughs> is that something you, you look at now, is balancing while you're, you're playtesting and prototyping? Or are you just trying to dig in on mechanics and, and how the game is going to work rather than, than overall at this stage? I think at, at that stage, because it is quite a simple game, mechanically there wasn't too many places to go yeah. from the original set collecting. So I think I got quite lucky in that instance. The the balancing of mechanics was quite limited to pure set collection, um, except for a couple of the Great Egg Fly, which really is a, a bit of a game changer. Mm. But um, yeah, I guess it just depends on the way you're designing it because adding ex extra spins on stuff like a, a worker placement that has, I don't know, a look at um, Raiders of the North Sea, yeah. where you do the action where you pick up and do the action where you put down. That is amazing and quite innovative. and It's just a, another spin on it. So yep. I think, I don't know, it just depends on what you're designing and your thought process. Fair enough. Prototyping can take a while because you are, you are trying to get it to that point where you're ready to start testing on balance and, and move on to art and then, and then the full design. How long did it take you to, to, to play test, to prototype, to, to get to a point that you were happy? Um, it, it was a good couple of months of testing, and like I said, even from what I thought was quite finished, was far short of what I'd worked with the publisher to get yeah. it to a final product. So it took a couple of months of getting it, okay, I think I've got a layer, I think I've got it balanced. And ideally I was like, a oh, wallet game, put in your pocket 18 cards, fine. And then I approached an artist who was a friend of mine, and I'd actually approached her with two games. Um, now, the thing was, this is off on a tangent. The I think as a first time designer or publisher, in this stage, I thought I was going to be publishing on Kickstarter. Mm. And I'm not a full time game publisher, obviously, this is my first one. So I was looking a lot at Kickstarter what is going to be my upfront costs? Um, not to be a you know, cheapskate, but what is reasonable for me to be able to afford as a hobbyist who's mm. trying to then potentially one day transition this into a full-time job. So I'm not going to drop 20 grand on my first game no. of art assets, Kickstarter assets, graphic design, stuff like that. So I was like, okay, this one had, at the time, five, five pieces of art and we reused the art as the box cover. Okay, so that's manageable. Um, so, yeah, so that will, did definitely go into my thought process when starting to design this game is, okay, well, what how can I minimise my upfront to then use any gain from that later to then work on to potentially something bigger? More, more, yeah. uh, it's keeping the game simple then helps with every other aspect of it. Exactly. And, and, and it makes it easier to design. And God forbid, if I were to have come up with a big loss, my loss wasn't as big and it was a learning experience in the process. Yeah. So when I approached her, I had two games. Um, one of them, I am, apart from, you know, this obviously got published, the other one, <laughs> like a month and a half later, um, there was a game called Leviathan that came out on Kickstarter. I think it was Leviathan. And it was basically a Moby Dick style 18 card game, but it was like a minis game without the minis. Yeah. And somebody was, you know, Moby Dick, and then oh, what's the sailor's name who was chasing him? I can't remember. My, my classical literature is not. Oh, I I'm, can't I'm a filmmaker. Novels are over anyway, there. So, so it was all about them, him chasing the whales and stuff, but then it was, you know, the other player would have a whole bunch of whales. And it, it was very similar to that. So I was basically doing a submarine-style battle thing. Yeah. So it was very, very similar to that. But now looking at that and having backed it, was, they did an amazing job, better than what I had done. So I'm so glad that I didn't chase that one. But at the time, I had two games. And I approached her and said, 
which one are you more interested in working on me with? And she went, the butterflies, like, hands down. So <laughs> Her background is tattoos and she's like, I love the style that you're trying to aim for and the Japanese style will definitely help me. And she's like, yeah, that's the one. I was like, okay, that's, that's the way we're going. We're going to give this a shot. Well, we'll touch on researching theme and, and getting all that in just a moment. Um, Playtesting takes a long time, as you said. It took a couple of months. Um, you initially started testing with your wife, and you said to me in, in previous games we've played that you, you've played that, this game with her more than anyone else. But not, not anymore. Not anymore? Not anymore. Okay. Kim, if you're watching this, absolutely hands down, the, <laughs> the owner of Good Games who signed it, oh my god, we've had... A lot uh, of games. Thousands. I, no, no exaggeration. I just <laughs> thousands. thousands. Fair enough. Um, where else can you and where else did you play test? Because you, you really want a, a wide test audience so you can have things come up that you would never think about, that your close friends would never think about because you probably think very similarly. Absolutely. Um, so they're quite, I mean, in Perth we're a little bit limited, but we have some fantastic resources. There's Play Up Perth, yep. um, an event that I think is held every six months, um, where I tested out initially with, with the laminated cards. Um, there's the Game Foundry, which is a game testing group that meets up um, every second week. And then just friends who are gamers, yep. like you know, Reese over there who's on the other side of the camera, I'm <laughs> you know, making them guys play it. And people, just anyone who you can, and I'm pretty sure people were sick to death of hearing me say that I'm developing a game <laughs> or designing a game. It's pro probably a benefit of having such a small game is you can just whip it out and play test it yeah. somewhere. <laughs> it's probably the, the perfect kind of game to, to design if you are trying for the first time. And I don't know whether you just lucked into that or... Oh, hey, I've, I always, like I said, I knew it was going to be a smaller less upfront kind yep. of, less gamble initially. But. but I reckon if anyone out there looks around at their local, local board game Facebook groups, local board game forums, board game geek has thousands, I'm sure, um, there'll be someone out there willing to play test for you within a few kilometres. Actually, that day is strong. Uh, Tabletop Game Designers Australia, within Australia, those yep. guys are, are fantastic. And it's a very, I think oh, quite a few of the guys have read through the rules and definitely given me great feedback, even if they haven't necessarily played test, they help in some way, giving feedback on art, graphic design. Um, it's just unreal what they actually contribute. And the industry as a whole, like you can't, I can't imagine any other creative industry where the other people or your, literally your competitors are trying to help you make a better mm. game because chances are they're going to buy it and want to enjoy it themselves. So yeah, uh, even like the PAX event, the collaboratory um, is just a fantastic way. Of yeah, and, and tabletop game designers run events at PAX or you know, when packs we were able to all get together. Um, so make sure you check them out on Facebook. It is a, a fantastic resource and just fantastic people. So when it comes to playtesting, how much are you, you rewriting the rule book based on what you playtest? At, at what point are you happy with the rule book as it stands? Um, now this is kind of from listening to a lot of podcasts. Uh, a lot, some people will want to write the rule book basically before they start testing. Other mm. people will do it on the fly. Um, this. I think it was pretty close to what, like I said, what I thought was complete as far as the mechanics concerned before I actually started putting pen to paper. Uh, everything else is just scribbled notes in here of, oh, this works, this doesn't, this is works. Is that this. whole book just pretty, design process on this? Pretty, oh, not just this one. There's a whole bunch of other random ones, ones that failed, ones that I'm working on yeah. at the moment. But um, I mean, having a notebook's good, but your phone, memo on my phone is just full yeah. of this works, or oh, what about this, or oh, this, and yeah, it's and, just... And I guess keeping track of different versions and, and, and keeping... I was not the best at that. Not the best? No. But would recommend? Absolutely. <laughs> Documenting exactly what you're testing that instance, because I've kind of tested something, and then gone and changed it slightly, it didn't quite work, and then I've gone back and gone, all oh, right, how did I do that again? And having to kind of sift through the notes. and But yeah, definitely make sure you... Document each process. And don't change too much mm. at a time. If you think you're onto something good, if you change five things at once, you're not going to know which ones worked and which ones didn't, be, especially if they're you know, mushed together. Yeah. Uh, little, little incremental changes to, to figure out yeah, where your game's direction is going. So that takes you a good, good couple of months. Um, 
at what stage did you personally look at the theme? Because you did say before, some people do theme first, some people do mechanics. Yeah, um, look, when, I want to come back when you say it took a good couple of months, and that's only on a tiny little game. After designing this, I have so much more respect for people who put out bigger games and the process involved with that. It's just, there is a lot. I think I was quite naive when I started as to how involved it was going to be. Well, well it, it, it's like Orson Welles said when he was directing Citizen Kane, he didn't know, it was his first film he was directing, he didn't know what the camera could and couldn't do, mm -hmm. so he just tried what he thought would work. There, there isn't the, the background info that you've looked at everything. It's not to say to don't research and don't think about stuff, but if you are naive, you, you can have a fresh look at what things can oh. and, and can't be done. Absolutely. Like, th there are so many good resources because, like I said, board game designers and publishers really do want to have the best products out there, so they help each other. So there are a phenomenal amount of resources, but that still doesn't quite prepare you for, for how involved it's potentially yeah. going to be. But anyway, sorry, I completely divert. No. Um, so the theme. Yeah, so actually backtracking, I, I told a bit of a lie before. So the, the game that we'd done about looking after the kids, that may be actually happened after this, but it still doesn't take away from the fact that it yeah. was pretty rubbish. Because this <laughs> this was actually a help as a coping strategy. Um, so, and this is going to sound weird how this is going to tie into the theme, but just bear with me. Go right ahead, you're um, the expert here. So when, when we started designing it, I was like, oh, it's a pyramid, you know, it makes sense to be Egyptian. I'm like, oh, but there's a lot of good Egyptian games out there, like I can't really compete with that. Um, but one of the things that really threw me into game design was I, w I was buying a, a lot of Kickstarter and I was kind of watching and obviously the algorithm shows up with all the successful ones. Yeah. And I'm looking at some of these games and going, oh, I can do this. <laughs> and so I'd started thinking about designs and I'd started talking with my friend who helped me try and design the, the other, the baby one. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd, I think I'd entered this as maybe my, I'd started this as maybe a second or third game. But what had happened when we were, I was buying a lot on Kickstarter, we were trying, um, basically we were trying to have our first son um, or our first child. And we'd had three miscarriages leading up to that. Yeah. And as a kind of coping strategy for loss, I really threw myself into game design. It helped you know, distract from what was going on. So, you know, if come the evening, late night, I would start jotting down ideas or stuff like that. And it really kind of it came a way of helping me to cope with the loss. Mm. Um, so, and then, like I said, really random tangents. The white butterfly, when we'd come home from each of our, basically our losses, our yard was full of butterflies each time, and it was almost quite eerie. And then butterflies had kind of had, obviously, this little special place and it helped me get into it, so I was looking, oh, butterfly theology, how can we, you know, jump into this? Um, and I'd found a lot. There was the Irish butterfly who jumps through realms. And then I came across the tale of the white butterfly, which was the Japanese story, which was even more creepy because it were white butterflies that had filled a house. And uh, now I'm looking, I think it was like the cabbage hunt, which is so common in Australia. So of course yeah. it was a white butterfly. But yeah, so I said, well, what about collecting butterflies? Butterflies are pretty, it has some attachment to me. And then I threw in the story of the white butterfly. And that's how, when you win a round, you take a white butterfly token. But I had a lot of hesitation because I was like, well, is that, is that going to appeal to people through Kickstarter? How does that go marketing-wise? And then it got to the point where I went, nah, I'm just, just going to do it. And the art back, came back phenomenal. And I went, wow, this is, if this isn't going to grab people's attention, I'm not quite yeah. sure what theme I could have. It is, it is beautiful. And this is, this is the art on the left here. This was your original draft? So that, they were the original drafts. Well, actually, not drafts. They, they were the... Oh, yeah. That, that's I true. guess the question <laughs> is, did you do drafts? Because <laughs> it sounds like you're looking at publishing on Kickstarter and, and looking at all of that and what art you needed. Absolutely. And I guess what, what was the process for, for so, that? So it was, so I was very, very lucky that Diana, um, who's the artist for it, she is um, unbelievably talented and she was going to help me with some of the graphic design stuff as well, despite that not being her kind of specialty. Hmm. She's a tattooist. Um, but then if we look, even the backgrounds of different cards had changed. So it had, it basically this was very, very close to finish, but we changed very subtle things, like making these a little bit more, um, it's making them easy, easier to differentiate because okay, yeah. if we look at the swallowtail compared to the egg fly, they're quite similar looking. Yeah. But then, so we changed the, the background to make it, it look it, a little bit different. Even these two, just the, the, the difference between the red and the orange and the final, yeah, absolutely. final drafts, fi so, final product. Is, so we did quite enough. a bit of work on that, but then, 
once I started working with good games, well, they just took it to a whole other level. And they were, okay, well, let's just flip the butterflies. Let's change the tone on this slightly. Let's add the scientific name down the side. Let's add how many cards are there. Let's change the graphic design and a whole lot of stuff that I was like, I thought about this, but just not to that extent. They just <laughs> ran with it and obviously showed their professionalism having had successful Kickstarters and having put games out there knowing what works. Um, the so experience of having someone almost mentoring you is, absolutely. is, is huge. Have, having talked with other, other designers, just because working with publishers can be so intense, so, so in-depth into something that you've created, having someone else either within that company or outside of that company helping you through the process um, can just be just, just the world of difference as... as like, well, the uh, success of your game. Even, so. even down to the box. Like, if you actually look at the difference, what they've kind of done is... So this one is sideways. Well, that is so when it's on the shelf, you can see it that way. But then on the other side, it's like that. So if it's on the shelf sideways, it's like that. So there's just so much oh. thought had gone into uh, adding icons so it's easier to see. Uh, like I had it on the back, but just not as obvious. So they just took it to a whole other level, really. That's intense. So art is one of those things that makes or breaks games. If you want to capture someone's attention on the shelf or on Kickstarter, you need good art, um, which is really hard because artists deserve to be paid. You, you, you wanted to pay your artists quite well. It, is art something that can be done on a budget for smaller games? Um, well, again, like I was saying, that's one of the appeals to me working on a smaller game was that art and the upfront would have been less. Yeah. Um, but I think I got very lucky with having a friend who was an artist who was willing to work with me at quite a reasonable... Reasonable rate. Yeah, uh, like I said, I don't want to go into it too no, much, but that's, I, that's, that's she did an amazing, amazing job. And how long, was there a lot of back and forth, or did you just have to trust your artist um, to go, this is what I need? I, I told her kind of what I wanted and which butterflies. And again, this is having worked with somebody who very much is a professional in her field. She rolled with it and went, okay, well, the monarch, the monarch feeds off milkweed. Okay, I have to make sure I draw that. Things that I hadn't even thought about was like, oh yeah, a couple of monarch butterflies. So even the yeah. plants, she's got down to the detail of which plants are suited to oh, which wow. butterfly. I hadn't, hadn't even really thought, about, thought that. about that at all. And she's like, okay, well, I've got to make sure they're all the same kind of style. We're going for the, th the story is a Japanese story, so it needs to have a Japanese flair to it, which I definitely think it does. But yeah, so she really, there, there were a couple of minor things that I commented on, but. Yeah. And that was just <laughs> a, a drafting process back and forth between the two of you, or? Um, oh, the, the stuff that I'd commented was more like, oh, okay, it just needs to be this size to fit on the card. Oh, <laughs> like, okay, yeah. like it, no, no comment or criticism on, on, her, on uh, her work at all. Like, yeah. it was literally more like, these are dimensions it's got to be. This is the format it's got to be for the printers, stuff yeah. like that. Like, the rest of it was, and so in terms of art direction, I didn't give didn't, a whole didn't lot. Gi didn't give her like some crazy brief to fit this exact stuff, but I, but enough to go on to, I, to give I, her yeah, to get this product. I think so. And yeah, it just it's come back amazing. It, yeah, it really is beautiful. So you were saying you'd already looked at printing options because you were already considering Kickstarter and what that would all take for you. You didn't end up doing Kickstarter, but no. what does it take to to publish a game from Kickstarter? So you have to know what the games going to cost to make, obviously, yeah. and the shipping. They're your two real big things, and if you're adding stretch goals and stuff. Um, I had approached quite a few printers, um, and there was one that responded quite quickly, and when I looked at the games they'd produce one, why well, they actually have quite a reputation, and I do feel somewhat guilty that despite having communicated with them so much, I didn't end up utilising them, um, because obviously good games went through their channels. But making sure that what you what the product you're going to produce is a reasonable rate for what people are going to pay. Yeah. Um, and uh, Stone My Games and a few other you know, resources like that have indications of how much you should charge depending on how much it's going to um, cost you to produce. But you want to make sure it's competitive in the market. Yeah. Um, and then going into shipping, um, there are a lot of uh, avenues out there. And then there's so it's very involved. And to be honest, looking at it now, I'm going, wow, I'm so grateful that they took on my game <laughs> because there's a lot. There's, if you're going into Europe, you want to make sure you've got your valued added tax kind of added on. Are you going to be using regional 
um, distribution networks. Like there's so many different ones out there. You've got to make sure you get the games from obviously the printer on the ship out to different regions. And yeah, I, I started to learn, I could learn quite a lot about it, but there is so much more to learn, particularly as somebody who never actually had to go through that. Is that another thing that speaking with people through like tabletop game designers, like that people have experience with that that you can reach out to for? Absolutely. There's, um, to be honest, within the community, I found everybody is so overwhelmingly helpful. If you're active in the groups and you're talking to people and giving any kind of feedback, they will jump on board to help you anyway um, and recommend, oh, this is who I use, this is the experience I had. So Kickstarter looked like a decent avenue for you at the time. Would you still recommend people go through Kickstarter if they can't get a publisher or is Kickstarter still such a changing beast that you've really got to be looking into the research well, I, of it to I, get I going? I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that, but if it's a game you're passionate about and want to pursue, then yes. But it also depends on what your goals are as a designer or publisher. Mm. If you want to be a publisher and if you want to go that route, or if you're happy to design and then have someone take over. Like, um, a, a friend of mine who's helped me massively with this game, um, and I don't want to name names in case he doesn't want this to be public knowledge, but he had self-published and he had funded and he'd done quite well. But his subsequent games, he went, that's not what I enjoyed about the process. Yeah. So his subsequent games he is pitching and I tell you I've played some of them they are really good so I, I can imagine they're going to be self-published I, I, I can imagine that they're going to fight land land with somebody yeah but um he said that that's not what I enjoyed I enjoyed making the games and getting it he didn't actually want to do that again yeah whereas other people who absolutely love publishing and want to do that avenue and would like rather sign other people's games and go that way that's entirely depends on what you want to get out of out of the industry and what you, the avenue you want to pursue. But I think for the most part, designers start out with their baby and they want to get it yeah. out there. And, it it makes is, sense. You, which you, is why you. when Good Games approached me at PAX, um, I was at first kind of a little bit starstruck. <laughs> um, but then I was like, yes, I want to get my game on as many tables as possible. And they already have systems in place and they have a huge email list and they have the capability of getting it onto as many tables mm. as I have. Oh, sorry, so many more tables than, than what I would. So yeah. I was absolutely jumped at the chance to work with them and I'm so grateful I did. So what was the process like of going going to PAX? So you went to PAX to try and sell this or just no, no, to promote? No, so I, I went to purely promote. Um, I went on the collaborator and I was trying to generate an email list, generate a bit of hype and try to get out there and get this some attention. And that's not just a PAX thing, that's board game conventions all across the world. Um, you will find people all across the, the shop floor just promoting, selling, talking to people, trying to get feedback on their game, right? Yeah, like that's, yeah absolutely. That's the main point of board game conventions as far as I'm aware. Pretty much, it's either to sell or to get games out there and promote you. Yeah. And, and what was it like at PAX Australia? It was, at that point, I hadn't ever seen anything like it because, I mean, in Perth we don't have anything no. like that. But it was it was huge. Um, it was kind of surreal having a pass that allowed me to walk through and walk straight past a massive queue of people going <laughs> in. There was it was under the, have a little bit of a sneak peek at everything that was going on. So so you get a, a like a board game publisher. Yeah, pass. sorry. So the, the, yeah. the reason I was able to do that was because I joined up on the um, Tabletop Game Designers Australia booth um, with the intention of promoting the game, and I'd also kind of landed a spot in the collaboratory, which is a section usually uh, to the side of, well, I shouldn't say to the side, but it's a section of the board game area where people are trying to promote games that they've been working on. And to be honest, I, I felt a little bit like a very small fish yeah. because I was, as I was setting up my game, there's guys like Shannon Kelly who just had a huge hit with Lucidity, which had then signed on to Renegade, and he mm. was promoting his newest one. And then there was you know, Rare Roses, which was just absolutely stunning to look at. And there's me posting this with my little flyers and they've got huge banners and I'm like, oh dear, what, a, what am I doing? I feel very out of my depth here. But it got great feedback and then um, Jamie from um, Good Games came and played it and then he brought over Kim and I didn't quite realise who they were at first until Kim's like, hey, I'm Kim from Good Games I'm really liking him. Okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> As you said, a little bit starstruck. Um, so, so there are publishers out there looking for games. They, like, that's how they make their money. They are going to be paying attention to this stuff. So 
I guess if, it's it's hard at the moment with yes, the current kind of climate. But um, I would recommend to anyone who's designing and wants to go the publisher route, jump onto Cardboard Edison because they have a basically archive of who is looking for what and are they accepting submissions at the moment and how to approach them. It is just such a good resource. Awesome. So for you, conventions were the thing that got you in the door with a publisher, mm -hmm. um, but there are other routes and, and publishers do just take submissions. Don't flood your publishers with submissions. Check and, if they're and, open for it. And make sure there's some great articles out there. There's one that's literally called um, Courting a Publisher, and it is how to approach and what you're actually um, basically the best way, and knowing their product line and what's going to suit you. Yeah. So you don't just want to send the same email to the same publishers and be like, hey, I've got this massive heavy euro, and I've sent it to a company that only really produce family game. Hey. Yeah, it's it's a job interview of sorts. You're, 100%. You're, you, you need to tailor it to the person that you're working with, and, and you're, but you're, at the same time you're selling a product, you still need to make it sound good yeah. to them specifically. So once, you, you got kind of lucky, we, you've uh, admitted that to me, absolutely. good games approached you, which is so yeah, cool. Yes, yes and no, like uh, they, they played the game at the convention, yeah. and like from there. Yeah. I think we'd had a very brief email kind of Facebook conversation earlier and they said, oh, what are your intentions with it? And I said, oh, I'm going to try to self-publish. And they liked the look of the art, and I guess, which massively helped the artwork, thanks, Gianna. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> said, they, good art sells games. They, they liked it from there. So, yes, I got absolutely very, very, very lucky. Very lucky, but you put the work in to make a good game beforehand. Yeah. The, the yeah. Luck is yeah. always a factor in any creative what's, work. What's the, uh, the saying, luck is a combination of preparation Prep, yeah. and timing or something? I can't remember how it goes. <laughs> I'm sure people will understand. So once, what was your packs like after talking to them? I, I'm just curious to hear, so, did you just talk to them after that or were you still working on the, the collaboratory floor? So I was still working, but I think it was actually quite late in the con where they kind of approached me. Okay. Um, but even before that, I got a lot of good email, uh, sorry, I got a decent, decent email list from the TGDA booth. Um, I got good feedback. I basically had a horse throat because I wasn't stopped talking. And th again, that goes to show you the community. Um, Michael, um, who he designed Misdirection and he's got a current, I think I'll probably be finished by the time this is on, but another Kickstarter. He loved the game and then went and grabbed some of his friends to bring it over to show them. And I was like, well, it, strictly speaking, it is competition, but he's bringing people back, and like, yeah. just how warming the game community is is just unreal. But yeah, so it, it was it was doing quite well, and I was I was feeling pretty good about it. But when they came, yeah, it was just just that, that next yeah. level. <laughs> What's the process like when you're working on that convention floor? Do you have a, a list in front of you? Do you let the of taking people's names down? Are you taking feedback, like giving people feedback forms? Yeah, what, so... What are you looking for? So gave you're getting... them, give them basically a feedback form that at the bottom has, um, are you interested in hearing more about this game? Please put your email. Yeah. Um, at that stage, whether it was tweaking a rule, adding other things, and the, the biggest feedback was more depth and replayability through additional layouts, yeah. which, um, like I said, I had tried a bunch, I had never got it quite balanced, but then when I started working with, with the Good Games team, they went, we want more layouts. And they changed some tweaks about. Um, for the most part, it wasn't too much, but it was very minor kind of adjustments about points or scoring. Like the biggest one, you can see the monarch. Originally, it was one gives you one point. Now it's yeah. a stacking system. So they're like, no, we want, we want to change a couple of things, and then go back and balance that to the initial layout, which is layout one, which has been tested, oh my God, so many times. And then from that, brainstorming as many layouts as we could. They came up with a bunch. I came up with a bunch, and then applying what we had balanced to each of those layouts and then seeing if it was balanced. And I'm talking test each one 20 times. Yeah. And if you had a 10-10 split, Kim and I would test it 100 times. And then if that came back at a 50-50 split, that's the one we're going to include. But then, again, they just took it to another level and put it into a computer program. They, I, I can't remember the guy they worked with, but they then said, OK, we're going to simulate this and let's throw it through a thousand times and see what our s split is just That's to so make crazy. sure there's no... Because it's a two-player game. Yeah. And f you know, first player or second player advantages are going to be so noticeable, especially if they're big splits. Some of the layouts we had were like literally nine out of ten first player would win. Wow. I was like, no, nah, that's been it. Can't. No, not worth it. <laughs> but um, so there was, yeah, there was a lot of development that went into it after. And we, after about 40-odd layouts, we narrowed it down to 15 that worked. And then... Um, Joel Finch, who designed Unfair, he did a lot of the graphic design on it, and he took it again to a next level. He 
put all the scoring down the side, added the little butterflies in the corner, and they just had all these extra just things. The, the, just... the, the little bits that make the game just that much. The attention to detail. Yeah, attention to details was the exact thing I'm looking for. Was just, yeah, uh, even the way the box was laid out. And they went, okay, yeah. well, we're going to flip. So this was my original one. They're like, no, no, we need to split up the two black ones, so we're going to put it over there so it doesn't draw your eye to mm. a certain area, it draws it to the whole thing. Do we use um, is it the Spot UV where it has shiny bits? Like, no, because it might draw away from the beautiful art because in a game like Seventh Continent where it is just the black on the gold, well, then you want the Spot UV because it's nice and shiny. Yeah. So all these things I hadn't really considered and, like I said, they just kind of really even like bring all in a little bit, adding bits over here and oh, it was just... It was just that, that little bit of help and expertise to, to make your game the best it can be. Absolutely. First of all, how long did that process take working with them for, from, from the point that you signed the contract with them? Because that is, it, it is a contract. Yeah, so the, the contract actually wasn't signed until quite late on. Um, but that was fine. There was, we worked so hard on it together and they were very, very transparent with everything that was going on. Um, and I'd, I'd, this is, a, again, hearsay from other designers who basically they submit a game, sign it, and then they come back with a completely different product. But it's still their game, yeah. but there's a lot of change. Well, I was involved in the Discord thread with the graphic designers and play testers and people editing the rules and stuff like that. So it was, they, they involved me every step of the way, and it was just such a great learning experience to, to do that. But um, from them initially saying they were interested to final product was... So it, it basically from PAX to Gen Con, yeah. um, and at Gen Con they had... Gen Con's uh, usually July? Uh, oh, I think it was August. August. They, so so they, it's, it's almost a year from like October, September PAX. But, but that is, you know, now we'll talk about Gen Con a bit because I'm like, yeah. but basically I rocked up, yes, I rocked up, <laughs> and there was boxes of my game with the logo on the side of the box that said Fluttering Souls That's and stuff like so that. Cool. So it was from PAX where I they first kind of coined interest and let's work on this to Gen Con and there was a few hundred copies of a finished product. So That's awesome. Um, and, and you were saying you were involved the whole time, you were you were working with them that, that whole stage. Was there any stage, and feel free to not answer this, was there any stage where they overwrote you? They went, we believe this is the right way to do it? No, I don't, I don't think so. I definitely had hesitations. Yeah. Um, but, and I think this is advice to any designer, if you're working with a publisher and they have an idea about something they want to do, even if it's something you've tried, work with them because they are ultimately trying to make the best game they can yeah. with you because they want to sell it and make money and they want it to do well. So even though there were instances where I absolutely had hesitation about what was happening, but then we tried it and some of them worked. And I was like, okay, yeah, this is a great idea. Other ones are like, nah, it's don't really feel it. So I, I definitely felt like there was quite a, a partnership, but mm. at the end of the day, it, it becomes their product. Yeah, so that, that was the question I was kind of leading towards, is, is what's the relationship like? Is it, for you, it seems it was very collaborative. Yes. Um, while you've talked, you said other people might have their game almost taken away from them and, and reworked without them being involved, and I guess that comes down to talking with the publisher about about what kind of relationship you want to build with them and what yeah. the publisher is like themselves. I, I suppose, I mean, I, I think in this instance I'm not maybe the best person to comment on that because I did have such a really good experience yeah. with the guys that I worked with. That, um, and, and I think, again, Cardboard Edison do have quite a, vast, quite a lot of statistics out there about working with publishers and how first-time designers felt and how satisfied they were with their experience compared to people who had published, who yeah. designed and had 10 games published. And there was you know, quite... Potentially, in some instances, quite polarizing, but I think it depends on who you work with as a yeah. lot as well. Prototyping at the later stage can be a very interesting process because if you're you're publishing yourself, some printers might include it as part of the printing cost. They'll send you a prototype version of the game so you can see it all. Um, how did that work when you were working with good games? Did you see almost finished prototypes beforehand? Uh, I, they saw proofs, and they're in Sydney um, in Perth, a decent flight yep. away, so they'd sent me photos of the proofs. Okay. So they did receive them. Yep. Um, prototyping in this instance was done by the Game Crafter, and there are quite a few small print run manufacturers. I found the Game, game Crafter were quick and uh, quite a good product. But I wanted to see what the game was potentially going to look like on shelves before yep. I then went through. And this, I could take this to a few conventions and say, hey, this is pretty close to finished. Um, do you want to give it a shot? So 
this one was my one, and if I had have gone through Long Pack or Bangui or whoever, uh, yes, they would send a proof beforehand to make yep. sure everything's okay, make sure everything's in the right position and stuff like that. But that was absolutely uh, <laughs> against the stuff. And and how much? Just out of curiosity, how much did it change between the final product and the proofs? Did that involve like flipping some of the the butterflies? Um, or no, was the, the graphic think, designer. I think a lot of that had already been kind of sorted through. Um, so print is a lot more. Print, so through print and plays yeah. stuff like that, and then printing out what they thought was going to be the final play testing, saying okay, we'll modify this few, um, these few things. I think the only real thing between the initial initial print run and now is. Um, the thumb cutouts. Oh yeah, this yeah. wasn't in it. And then after Gen Con, there I think they said, "Yeah, we need to add those because a lot of people." Are sitting there going, Fair enough. Um, so, Gen Con, huge. You, you can see the smile <laughs> on his face. Huge moment for you. What's it like as a designer to be sent to promote your game and to sell your game at Gen Con? So I'll I'll backtrack a little bit first. Um, this I think. As far as I was aware, originally we had discussed Kickstart or straight to retail. And they held off in the kickstarting process and decided that they're going to Gen Con, so that's when they're going to launch it. Yeah. So they kind of told me that, and I thought, like, oh, okay. And they said, oh, yeah, we're going to go to Gen Con. And I kind of said it in jest, but also testing the waters. I'm, oh, well, if you're going to go to Gen Con, do you want to take me? And expecting, oh, ha, ha. And I was like, oh, we'll crunch some numbers and see how we go. And I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> And I think this was all through Discord, and I had just this big stupid grin on my face. And then they said, oh, there's some flights on sale for cheap, we can get you over there. And they said, can you get the time off? I was like, oh, we'll get the time off. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was, uh, it was the most amazing, like anybody who is, well, like obviously big ones at Gen Con S and stuff like that, but it is not like anything we have in Australia. So e explain it to people because I, I still can't believe the scope of it. It's so big that they had games on the football stadium. Yeah. Like it overflowed from the convention centre and the convention centre in Indianapolis is huge. So there was the exhibitor hall but then there was a game hall then there was other halls that were just solely for publishers and then they had the like um, conference centres in hotels yeah. booked out for games. Like the actual BGG hotness room yeah. was in uh, one of the hotels in the convention because it wasn't in the main convention centre. Then they had so this Lucas Oil Stadium PAX, playing games. Like. PAX Australia size like doubled so it covers so many different oh, places I in Indianapolis. I'd probably say it was maybe like five, four or five times as other packs, maybe four times. Okay, if, my, if you have my a, guess is way off. If, if then, you have a look at, I think, the numbers, I think over that weekend they got over two have 200,000 people through the turnstiles, I think. That's insane. Like, that, that's, I almost think you could be close to fitting Melbourne Convention Centre in just the exhibitor hall. Wow. Okay. And walking through on on the Thursday, I was the Wednesday when we're all setting up. I've got walking through with my camera phone, watching Simon setting up their stuff and Plaid Hat Games setting up their stuff, and I'm just like, oh my god! Like, <laughs> and then we got to our booth, and I was just like, I had the mentality of that weekend, I am going to be busting my gut to get my game out there. I'm setting up everything, and you know, just I almost felt that I had to prove. Mm. my work ethic and commitment to good games for just sending me over there. Yeah. Like, nah, we're going to make the absolute most of this. <laughs> but still having and, fun the whole time. Oh, I fanboyed out so hard. <laughs> um, I got a selfie with Tom Vassell. I got <laughs> selfies with the this come, game. Come back to Tom Vassell in a second. I got <laughs> selfies with the This Game is Broken crew. I chased down Mike Delicio for a photo. And then I met up with a bunch of guys that originally, when I thought I was going to kickstart, I had started asking them about... Um, now, obviously, these are people that I am fans of their channels anyway, because yeah. otherwise... And you have to make sure that if you're going to be you know, going the Kickstarter route, you need to make sure that the channels that you approach or the, the content creators, the YouTube um, presenters and stuff, that it's the right game to fit their channel. Yeah. Um, but there was a lot of guys like um, Kaz who from... Um, uh, Dice Odyssey, sorry, Kaz. I, I didn't forget. <laughs> um, <laughs> who I'd loved his stuff anyway that you know, I was like, oh, can we, can we catch up? Are you going to be there? Or you know, um, BJ from Board Game Gumbo. I was like, yeah. oh, dude, she, she come and play. And you know, guys like that. And yeah, so catching up and meeting these people who I'd only ever spoken with online was just was so cool. It was so good. So that's kind of the, the next thing I want to touch on. You, you've got your game. It is 
mostly finished, minus these little cutouts, your game is ready to sell. So how do you sell it at Gen Con? Are you just at your booth? Are you out there promoting to people? Like, what's every, it looked? Honestly, what's it looked like every every publisher had, had like their own kind of twist on the way they were going to sell. Okay. Some had stand up tables, they had like quick games. Um, this one, myself and Jamie were sitting down with Fluttering Souls, and they'd also released Fairy Seasons, and we we're kind of trying to get people to come through. And Kim was like, "Hey, you want to come play a quick game?" Like out there being a salesperson, trying to yeah. draw people in. Um, but it, it's good because it was. I can teach a round of this in less than a minute. Yeah. You can play around in three, the full game takes 20. So you're able to get a feel of the game quite quickly before a reset. So it was, I think it was quite, it's quite a, suited to a, a convention. Yeah. It really was. But then, obviously, at the beginning of Gen Con, sorry, I keep going back to that. The beginning of it, you rock up a couple of hours early and you're running around like you had this chook, buying the stuff that you want, all the hot what releases yeah. that you want to get and all the things that are quite that had been quite difficult to get in Australia. I had a list yep. of games that we couldn't get yet. I'm like, yes, yes. Because <laughs> Gen Con is a, a sales floor as well. Like, it, it, it's not even only an enthusiast and a publisher side of it. It is, well, I guess that's the publisher side of it. They yeah. are there to sell games. I um, I took two suitcases. I had one suitcase with clothes, put in a bigger suitcase that was empty just to bring stuff back. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So you were saying working with reviewers, had you already approached reviewers to work with or was a lot of that done at Gen Con? So when I was at this stage, I had approached quite a few. Um, there was um, Board Deck and Dice with Nick Welford, who's uh, from uh, Board Game Exposure. Um, there was um, Eagle's Eye View Games. I had approached Cass from Dice Odyssey. I'd sent a copy out to um, Geek City USA. So I'd, I'd contacted quite a few anyway, but and then- Is that just- just straight up cold calling them, cold emailing them? Pretty much, yeah, for the most part. Because um, I, mean, I can say, them... from, from a, a content creator side of it, please just approach us. We, we are always happy to hear about new games. Um, please, anyone, if you're publishing a your game, talk to content creators. They're people who love games. They'll give you feedback. It's well worth it. Absolutely. Like, yeah, just approaching these guys. But then I had to say to them, oh, so the version I sent you... Probably not going to be the final one because I'm now working with Good Games Publishing to get it better and get it out there. Yeah. So, and I, I do feel a little bit guilty because a couple of them had finished filmed. and filmed. We, we had. But <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I haven't named up to you guys yet. I didn't think it was necessary. That's but, fine. We're here. I'm on camera. But um, yeah, so I did feel a bit guilty, but I was like, I'm, I'm sorry. Like I. Because I'd sent them copies, because a lot of them, because uh, you know, the game craft was in the States, so I just sent yeah. a copy directly. It was cheaper for me to send a copy straight from the factory to them to keep than it was for me to post a copy that I already had and yeah. then get it back. So it's like, yeah, hang on to that one. But um, You mentioned before you got a selfie with Tom Vassell. Yeah. What's, there, there's a bit more of a story there, right? Uh, not really, no? actually. Yeah. Like, um, the guy that was you know, so busy that I actually think my selfie's kind of blurry because I was like, oh, dude, you got two seconds to... Okay, cheers. Did you um, give him a copy of your game at the time? Not the first time I met him. Because okay. the first time I met him, I was a little bit nervous. Yeah. Um, and then I think I saw him on the Saturday, and I kind of said, oh, hey, I've you know, got a game. Can, can we show you? And he's like, oh, see, the problem with that is I can't judge your rule book, and I actually can't give you honest feedback if you teach it to me and then we play it. So he says, go give me a copy. I was like, all right, I'll be two seconds. <laughs> and I ran back to our booth, grabbed a copy, gave it, and then he was like, oh, cool, yeah, cheers, thanks. And his review's up, and it's... Oh my god, getting a seal, seal of, of approval, approval from him. Yeah. I was, but I ran back to the guys. I was like, oh yeah, I just gave a copy to Vass and they what? <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, and like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I was like, oh no, should I not have done that? I'm like, oh no, he'll give us an honest opinion. <laughs> hey. But I guess, oh, that's the yeah, no, end. Sorry, I forgot. Unfiltered gamer as well. Yeah, he gives on completely honest opinions and he sat down and played it and got another selfie. Like I said, I was just fanboying yeah. out so hard. So do, do publishers set aside a certain amount of games to give away to reviewers? Or is it, like is that budgeted into to how much you're taking uh, to Gen Con? I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but it definitely was um, a case of... I obviously, not my product, so I wasn't in the position to say, oh, you're a reviewer, here you go. Yeah. But I think definitely the, the rest of the team were like, okay, you're a reviewer, here's your channel, verify it, oh, cool. Here's a copy. Oh, here's a copy of a game we're also working on. Yeah. And uh, give us some, some feedback about that. And again, from having games already, they already knew a yeah. lot of the reviewers, and they knew the guys that they like to work with. Um, and but this is you know, I'm purely observational. But there were obviously relationships there where they would say, "Oh yeah, we've worked with them. Can you 
take on this one as well. Yeah. And um, Game Boy Geek, I think they'd already maybe worked with them for Unfair and a few other things. They're, definitely, there was definitely a lot of games given out to reviewers to because it's it's marketing. It's, yeah, it's for them to be able to get it out there and hopefully more sales. Well, speaking of observational, you you wouldn't have had had the input for all the promotion and all the banners and everything that you had made for Fluttering Souls, or they had made for Fluttering Souls. Yeah. Did that work for you guys? And what other things did you notice at Gen Con that worked for other people, for people who might be looking to, to self-publish and, and see what they can promote uh, at Gen As far Con. as banners, so they basically had had banners that would have been the size of the curtain, probably bigger. Yeah. Like, they were huge. There was one that was the cover of Fluttering Souls, one that was the cover of um, Fairy Seasons, and then the other one, I think, was... Guildmaster one side, unfair on the other. So they had that set up. But everyone had their own twist. Yeah. Um, like some of the huge guys like AEG had stuff hanging from the ceiling, like massive cranes. There was a giant Pikachu that would have been the size of this room. Um, but I guess it just depends. Like, I guess it comes down to marketing. I, I, have a, I, I think that Kim had basically said, well, what's the tallest we can go? Let's go that tall. <laughs> like, Fair enough. Yeah. But it comes back to... Good art is going to pull people in more than anything else. You, you yeah. don't necessarily have to have the the biggest, flashiest piece of banner. You can have something small, but if it if it's eye catching, it's going to catch someone's eye, and that's your best chance to yeah, promote. Your it game. definitely has to be big to an extent, though. Like in a little corner of just a piece of paper on the table, that was pretty probably isn't going <laughs> to. I guess from that point on, you've done everything you can as the designer. Um, I, you, were you involved at all in the rest of the manufacturing side? Were you involved no, at all in the, the publishing side? That's no, not not to me. They, and again, they're so transparent. They were basically were saying, okay, so this is when it's going to be in the states. This is when it's going to. We're hoping to do a partnership with this distributor and stuff. So they absolutely very transparent yeah. about it, which has been fantastic. And, and, and how long did that all take? From I guess Gen Con to then. Like, did, 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 you got a lot of attention at Gen Con, so, from what I remember. Yeah, so there were um, basically reviews straight back in Australia. I think it took a little bit of time um, to get it in the States, but I also think kind of with COVID hitting it, it kind of halted the sales yep. quite a bit. Um, I'm not exactly sure on the time frame. So it took you a little while to manufacture it, uh, and that's the side of thing that the publishers are going to help with. They're just going to handle all that for, for you, which lets you focus on the design aspects for everything else that you want to do. Yeah, there, there was um, you know, in the contract a kind of acknowledgement of my responsibility to obviously help promote as well. Mm -hmm. um, I had recently, when there was the um, the BGG con, I had ran a few how to play sessions through table, uh, Tabletop Simulator. Yeah, um, and yeah that's something we haven't touched on. Tabletop Simulator is a huge thing for testing games. Uh, and it is now. Promoting. I don't think it wasn't when I started, or it may have been, but not as well. Not as well but now yeah. it is it's huge. And they've made it quite user friendly, especially if it's just cards and there's some pre, you know, set token or pre kind of um, coded tokens and stuff like that to put in there. It's just definitely become a huge resource if you can get yeah. it on there and gets it gets your testing games internationally as well, getting yeah. other people's opinions. At the end of the day, it's it's their product, but it's still my name on the front of the box and my baby. So I, you'd be lying to yourself if you said you weren't invested in it on yeah. an emotional level after that. Like, I, you know, I wanted to do as well as possible. Yeah. And they've definitely helped facilitate that beyond what I think I could have done by myself. Um, even if even if it wasn't an obligation, I'd, you'd, you'd do it anyway. Yeah, you, 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 board game design seems to be, even more so than any other creative industry, something you have to love to, to push through with it. Yeah. It, is, it is not easy. No. Um, so on, on that topic, is there any final thoughts and advice you would give to someone in designing and attempting to publish a game? So this is not design or publishing advice. I mean, I guess it is because it does. it's all kind of relative. Get involved in the community. Get involved in the Facebook groups. Get involved in your favourite reviewer. Like, you know, with you guys, if you're a fan of Nerds of the West, how much does it mean to you guys when somebody pops a comment or somebody shares oh, your link or stuff like that? It's it's the biggest thing. Uh, someone walked and, into my local game store and bought a whole bunch of games and referenced us, and just hearing that is is so huge. And then having people be like, hey, I really love what you're doing. Here's my game. It's, yeah. it's and, and bouncing amazing. off that, that familiarity, if you have somebody who's constantly sharing, constantly reposting, constantly commenting, well, the more you see that name, the more familiar you become with them. So if they were then to approach you saying, hey, I'm working on this, can you help? Well, you're going to be more likely to work 100%. with them anyway. So 
comment on your favorite reviewer stuff, you know, and get involved in the groups. And you know, on Facebook groups now, it has the whole conversation started, video, yeah. um, not video, sorry, um, visual storytelling, visual storytelling, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So that shows that you're being more and more industry. And I'm pretty sure the algorithms work now that when you have that, it gets seen by more people. Yeah. Now, this comes back to um, a group that I, this is like when I first kind of started, the, there were you know, quite a few big groups, and one that I jumped on and I wanted to do regular posts with was Board Game Exposure. So I was doing every Friday, I would set my alarm so that three o'clock Australian time would be like three in the morning, kind of in the States. Everyone's so, starting to wake up slowly, <coughs> oh, maybe. Three, maybe. <laughs> But to post then would kind of capture the evening for us, the morning for them, and I wanted to be, okay, I'm going to try and engage into a group. Yeah. And, you know, I, again, was working with them and posting as much as you can regularly, but after a while I, I had the conversation stuff, I had the visual storyteller and all that kind of stuff. And recently the guys asked if I wanted to be an admin of that group, mm. and then that group's exploded to almost 8,000 members now. And just to have, and you, you know the people that are posting stuff and you're more likely to, oh, this guy's contributed all the time and they're promoting a game. Oh, let's comment on it. Oh, it looks great, whatever. So just get involved in the community. And it is such a friendly community, really. I, Nobody's going to be upset with you for liking their no. their posts or their I, their views. But I think that is just the, the yeah, you, you've absolutely nailed it. Get involved in your local community. Get involved in whatever international communities there are. PAX Online is running all kinds of things, I'm sure. So make sure you're, you're, if you like board games, get involved with more board games. There is so much good stuff out there coming from smaller and creators. That's the beauty of Tabletop sim Simulator at the moment. You can play a prototype of somebody on the other side of the planet yeah. like, who's working on a game that they obviously love because they've spent a lot of time working on it, coding it, getting on Tabletop Simulator, trying to design it themselves. Like, yeah. yeah, it's been awesome. Well, I think that pretty much covers everything. It's come up with an idea, do lots and lots of playtesting, figure out some art in any way you can, and then look at what it takes to publish it. Because that And you will be on such a high after you finally have that product in your hand. Yeah. Um, on After Gen Con, after we're, my first game had sold out of Gen Con, and I'm on the way home, and you're on this kind of like, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't say like a, you know, a pit, but on, on the down, I was like, I'm going to make fluttering cells too. So I'm sitting there on the plane, and I have so many different layouts that I've drawn. You're just going to be on such a high, and once you kind of get a buzz for that, you just keep wanting to do more and more. So afterwards, it's like, oh, how do I make more? How do I do this? How do I change this? How do, expansions? Exactly. Like, exactly. How do I just cover everything? So. Um, but thank you so much, Joel, for, oh, for talking with me this. today and, and giving your insight into this. Where can people find you? So myself, you'll be able to find me under No Shout Games uh, on Instagram, rarely Twitter, but it is there, and Facebook under No Shout Games. And there's also a Fluttering Souls board game group um, where there's, if you have any questions about rules, gameplay stuff, where to find it, and occasionally we do a, a picture of the layout and say, well, what would you choose and why? I've been Tom from Nerds of the West. In case you didn't click, we make board game content, uh, reviews, playthroughs. We also live stream on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Nerds of the West. Um, make sure you're jumping into the Twitch community because it is just a great way to get feedback on games. Um, Good Games Publishing, thank you so much for all your support. Make sure you stick around to watch the rest of what's going on at PAX Online. Just have a great time, everybody. Have a great con.